Hello there. Welcome. Good evening. While you're eating and getting dessert, I think we get the show on the road. Uh, my name is Jeff Nelson, and uh, I'm very glad to have all of you here tonight. I, I do communicate a lot with the speakers prior to uh, the event to coordinate different things and sometimes get some interesting emails. And here's an email that I just received earlier this week from one of the speakers. In fact, it was Jeff Novick wrote to me and he said, do not make a big deal out of it or I will kill you, but Friday is my 52nd birthday. <laughs> is not making a big deal. <laughs> you got to leave, huh? All right, well, happy 52nd birthday, Jeff. You don't look a year or a day over 51. Seriously, you <laughs> must be that great food. Well, there's so many people to thank and acknowledge here for what we're doing this weekend. And first, I want to thank Nina and Randa for their beautiful performance. Thank you, girls. And just in case there's one person left in the world who hasn't seen this picture, this is Nina and Randa with Justin Bieber about a month ago. Whoops, can we see it on the screen? Let's go to the screen for the rest of this talk. There we go. Let's keep on the screen, please. That's Nina and Randa on the ends and Justin Bieber. They were in the You Smile video, which just came out about two weeks ago. And uh, not bad for the girls' second audition. And I can tell the girls tonight that we just got an email from their agent that they got the Nintendo commercial. So you were hooked for that, yeah. <laughs> so I want to thank Howie Anderson, our resident musical guru. Always does a beautiful job. And I want to thank Janet for his wife for letting us have Howie at all hours. Thank you, Janet. That's very nice. Uh, also, uh, in town, I, I want to acknowledge welcome is my brother, Jamie, uh, my brother-in-law, Marshall, and my sister, Mary Louise. You might have seen Marshall and Mary Louise out in the registration area. My brother, James, down from Northern California. Thank you guys for coming in. I could spend all night here mentioning uh, and acknowledging people here in the room and in this audience. Each and every one of you is a superstar. There's, I just have time to mention a few, and, and I do want to acknowledge uh, it's Chef AJ and Juliana Hever, who are the chef and the dietitian. They've got some great videos on YouTube. Uh, they're on the uh, kickoff cookoff, which was going to be on last night, but it's been postponed. These are vegan chefs competing against the rest of them, and uh, they are a key part of their Meals for Health program that we're going to be doing with EarthSave up in Sacramento. Uh, Meals for Health, many of you may know, we're going to be taking many of the experts, in fact, you know, most of the experts from this weekend and others to a food bank in Sacramento and getting a population of underprivileged people healthy through a plant-based diet. So quite an ambitious undertaking. And I want to introduce you to another member of our team, and that is Dr. Sharon Fleming, who's a senior investigator. Dr. Fleming is here in the first row. She's with us this weekend. That's, that's a photo from just last Friday when we were in Sacramento at the food bank having a meeting with the people up there. Anyhow, she's brilliant, fun, warm, and everybody should get to know her while you can. It's a rare opportunity to meet somebody like this. I also want to thank Larry and Ann Wheat, who are the owners of Millennium, who restaurant a fabulous restaurant in San Francisco. And I just want to know when are you guys opening one in the valley? We beg you, please. We'll be there. Uh, I also want to mention 
the Google guys. Uh, these are two guys who are here tonight, Ron and Vivek. Where are you guys? So there they are, right over here, uh, who are coming in. They're from, from Google executives there, and uh, uh, they're going to be trying to incorporate what we're all learning this weekend into the Google Borg, I guess you'd call it, and uh, we hope to be working with them. Resistance is futile, as they say. I think that, I think that maybe, yeah, thank you guys. I think that maybe 50% of the people here tonight are from Hugo's, courtesy of Dale Jaffe. Anyhow, welcome you guys, we're glad you're here, and this is another great restaurant we recommend if you haven't visited there yet. Now you all know that Saturday morning, tomorrow morning, you can get your cholesterol tested here at the Expo. You may have made um, uh, reservations, but even if you didn't, you can just walk in on a break and do it. And uh, in the afternoon, uh, Dr. Esselstyn is going to talk about what these mem numbers mean and why wouldn't you want to know what your numbers are and what they say about you. Then tomorrow night, we have a film that you're not going to want to miss. It's featuring Dr. Joel Furman. It's going to be here in the ballroom at 7.30. Dinner was offered from 5 to 7.30 in the hotel here. Anyhow, it's a thought-provoking, interesting, fun, and very enjoyable movie. So we'll be screening that. Okay, I want to talk for a minute about my family. Specifically, this is H.O. Those were his, this is my great-great-grandfather. Herman Oshin was his first and, and second name, and it turns out he knew Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison went to my great-great-grandfather's business and made films, made some films. In 1897, he went to uh, my great-great-grandfather's business and he made this movie. I'm sorry, there's no sound. This is an electric trolley um, that uh, is on the grounds of the Armour Meat Company yards, the stockyards in Chicago. And yes, that's me. I'm Jeffrey Armour Nelson. Uh, that's, that's my middle name. It's a family name. And uh, my family made the meat business a very big thing in this country about 150 years ago. And this is H.O. with his first wife, Mary Armour, which is also my mother's name, Mary Armour. And he had four wives. Three of them died in childbirth. This is the last wife, Jane Armour, who is about 30 years younger than H.O. This is a picture that hangs in my mother's bedroom. And my mother knew Jane Armour and grew up with Jane Armour. Uh, who frequently visited my mother's grandmother. H.O. Uh, died at the age of 60 uh, of a stroke, and uh, this is where he's buried in the Armour Mausoleum. It's in New York. It was designed by James Resnick, who also designed the Smithsonian Castle and the St. Patrick's Cathedral, as well as the Armour Mausoleum. And you know, my mom was very impressed with Jane Armour because when H.O. died, she went and had his first three wives dug up and stuck in there with him, so all four of his wives or with H.O. My mom just thought that was very generous of him to do. So this is H.O.'s brother, Philip Danforth, or P.D. Armour. And uh, let's just go back a little bit. In the 1850s, P.D. wanted to seek his fortune, so he went out to California. He walked, in fact, and it took him six months to walk from uh, Stockbridge, New York, to California to, uh, to be a miner. He walked with four other guys. He's the only one who actually made it all the way. But when he got there, he did not mine. Instead, he started a business digging sluices, digging trenches to bring water to miners, and he would charge the miners. And as the miners went out of business, as they so often did, because it was a very hard thing to do, he would hire those miners to dig for him. And in a short time, he had a very large crew of people working under him doing the actual digging. And by the time he left California five years later, he'd saved up $6,000. So that was a lot of money in, the, in 1855, and he went to from there to Wisconsin uh, because he'd met a man named Plankington who was a hog farmer. So he went to Wisconsin and he and Mr. Plankington went into business in a dry goods store as well as hog farming. Meanwhile, my great-great-grandfather, H.O., had a business called H.O. Armor in New York. And he was a trader, he traded in grains and he was a very successful trader. He made a great deal of money in New York uh, doing that. And P.D. was impressed and P.D. who sold pork barrels for his business, had a feeling in 1865 that the Civil War was going to be over soon and that the North was going to win and that the pork barrels that he was selling for $40 each were going to drop in price. So he traveled to New York 
And he and HO sold short pork. If you know what that means, they sold futures, they sold pork at, uh, at a price uh, that they knew that they could, they felt they could buy it at a cheaper price later and make people honor the, con the contracts um, and make a profit. So basically what happened was they sold futures to pork barrels that they didn't even own. Maybe it was a little scandalous. And then the war ended and they s sold that and they made $2 million in profits. They made $35 on each pork barrel. So in 1865, $2 million was comparable to about $27 million today. There's different ways of, of figuring it. It was actually, if you base it on the gross national product, it was, almost, it was over a trillion dollars. But um, so, H, so PD then bought his way into HO's company and together they had a grain trading as well as a business in slaughtering animals and, and dressing them for sale. And because of the confluence of all the grain that was available out in the West, the trains that could bring animals to a central location where they could be slaughtered at, uh, you know, at low expense, um, they set up their headquarters in Chicago. And these are pictures from the 1890s of the Chicago stockyards. And the animals were brought in by train and, uh, and dispatched and turned into uh, food. Their armor was the first to use canned meat and the first to use assembly line techniques. Here's another film uh, of cattle that had just come off a, a train and being herded in to slaughter. They, as I say, they pioneered the assembly line. This was before Ford. They uh, found multiple ways of speeding it up, of slaughtering more animals, of being able to bring the price down. And it was basically this assembly line technique that they applied. If you look at this one, there's kids making sausage. They're about 12 years old working in there. Um, they found many different uses for the materials. They made string um, out of lamb intestines. Uh, they were killing 50,000 hogs a day. They, had, they used curled hair for padding and furniture. They had a saying that they used everything but the squeal. They owned uh, a huge number of refrigerated train cars for which they transported the food across the country and over to Europe as well. This is what the stockyards looked like in 1900 from a balloon. And they had branches in many other cities and countries. They grew and grew. They had 15,000 employees at the turn of the century. And as a result, they became very wealthy. They had, uh, there's P.D. the third out there posing, probably not doing too much work. This is my great-grandmother's house. They called it Petronia. It was built on 21 acres of the Long Island Sound in Rye, New York. And my, my mother grew up often at this home. She basically grew up in a castle. You can't see it. It's, it's even uh, more impressive. They had nice summer homes. And uh, nowadays, uh, uh, the summer homes, you can go get married in them, or they've become universities or private clubs or schools. One of the brochures I always liked that the armors produced early on was this thing about the armor bridge. If you look in the lower left, it says, armor bridges the gap between livestock producer and the consumer. So you see there on the right, there's all these cattle coming into the bridge. And on the left, there they're all leaving in packages and neatly and ready to go. So it's just something magical in that bridge. We don't see what happens. But, but armor is the, the bridge there. Okay, and here's a, from the same brochure. You see on the left, the, the, you know, the very wise uh, capitalist in the middle. Uh, he's got this, the golden scale of supply and demand, which he's weighing. On the left is the producer, the cattle out there in the bucolic range. And on the right is the consumer, the city who wants to eat it. But on the packer, it's just a solid red color. There's no picture depicting what, depicting what the packer is doing. And that's because nobody wants to see what the packer is doing. I think that my family, we armors, helped make this possible. And thanks to my great-great-grandfather and his brother, uh, everybody can have meat three times a day, and it's easy and cheap, and it's on every corner. But there is hope. And people have started questioning the diet that progress has created for us. 
This is one I like, an article I just came across, is Help the New Hedonism, and it talks about rock stars. Don't panic, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle hasn't disappeared. It's just been modified to include wheatgrass, shots, and superfood smoothies. So we're seeing that increasingly. Here's Jason Miraz. He's a raw vegan rock star, a huge musical star. And so increasingly, it's not so cool to just uh, you know, take your money and kill yourself with awful things. They're taking their money and they're getting healthy and uh, enjoying success. So that's, that's what becomes more cool. Here's a button I like. Ask your doctor if medical advice from a television commercial is right for you. <laughs> now this is about somebody we all know. Okay, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is to plant it now. And who am I talking about? Clinton. Actually, a plant-based diet. I live on uh, uh, beans, legumes, vegetables, fruit, no dairy. I drink almond milk, and it changed my whole metabolism, and I lost 24 pounds. And I got back to basically what I weighed in high school. So is Bill Clinton the new Constantine for us? Is he the guy that's going to make plant-based mainstream? And how did this happen? This movement has been led by a doctor named Caldwell Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. That's right. So this just gives you an idea of the caliber of people that you're going to be hearing from this weekend. It's very high caliber. You can't have the father without having the son. You know that. So Rick is going to be talking Saturday. This is, this is the only person about whom my 16-year-old daughter said, is it cool to think an old guy is hot? <laughs> We're going to be hearing from our resident nutritional master and Zen master, Jeff Novick. And of course, this is the guy who's responsible for training our daughters how to cook so that we don't have to cook anymore. Thank you, Jeff. We do appreciate that. Dr. Joel Furman, he's speaking tomorrow as well. He always inspires you to try to improve your diet so you can be more like him. It's true. That's Saturday. And you know, this, I took this shot in Whole Foods just the other day. And if you go into Whole Foods, they've got this thing called the Andy score, where you can see nutritionally how different foods rank. This is 100% Joel Furman's invention. I'm so glad Whole Foods has invented it. I use it all the time. I love it. So Sunday morning, we're going to start early with cooking demos, the strangest and most entertaining cooking demos you'll ever witness. That's what we're famous for. Then our wise and wonderful personal monk, Reverend Hung Shur, will be speaking. <laughs> Everyone needs to have one, so don't miss him Sunday morning. And of course, the Grand Poobah, John McDougall, will also be here Sunday. Uh, Mary, John's wife Mary, is also going to be coming Sunday, so we're looking forward to that. And uh, our glorious leader, he started it all, at least for us. John Robbins will be here as well on Sunday. Uh, and tonight, the new kid on the block, Matt Lederman. I think he ordered some wine here tonight and they carted him, but I'm really looking forward to his talk.